He's been called the new Obama. 33-year-old Arab-American Abdul El Sayed is a doctor, health policy expert, and former Rhodes Scholar who's never held elected office before. But he's running to be governor of Michigan. And if the size of his rallies are anything to go by, this charismatic left-wing insurgent could pull off a huge upset and triumph at the Democratic primary on Michigan. August 7th. And if we are willing to reach across these divides, if we're willing to touch hands on something that is far greater than we are, our shared future, I know that there are solutions that we can push forward. El Sayed's biography and rhetoric may be Obama-esque, but his politics and his policies are much more of the feel the burn variety. The former director of Detroit's health department, El Sayed supports Medicare for all, making college tuition free and raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. He's been endorsed by both Bernie himself and by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, democratic socialist and the new rock star of the American left, who's come out to Michigan to campaign for him. We can't say, gee, what is somebody else doing? Gee, I hope it's going well. If you're not on a door, if you're not on a phone, if you're not writing a postcard, it ain't going well. Like Bernie, he's up against an establishment Democrat, Gretchen Whitmer, former leader of the Democrats in the state Senate, who has the support of the big donors. El Sayed, for the record, refuses to take a dime of corporate money. He's also up against a millionaire called Sri Thanedar, who pretends to be a progressive, but was a fan of Marco Rubio not so long ago. So, will El Sayed pull off a shock victory in this Democratic primary and provide further evidence that the party is shifting more and more to the left? And if he wins the primary, what are the odds of him going on to become America's first Muslim governor? I've come here to Michigan to ask him. Abdul El Sayed, thanks for speaking with me, taking time out from your campaign to speak with me in The Intercept. Thanks for coming to visit, really appreciate it. You've got all this momentum, all this energy, but what do you still need to do, do you think, to secure victory on Tuesday, to pull off that huge upset? We've got all the momentum. The thing about momentum is you've just got to keep it going. And we feel really good about that. I'll tell you, you, know, you have the rallies and you have the, 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 the media and the coverage. To me, what, what's most inspiring is that we've reached into the hearts and minds of everyday Michiganders. 15,000 people are making calls, are sending text messages, are knocking on doors uh, about this campaign. And we know that if we can keep that momentum going, we can keep, keep touching Michiganders, that we can win. A lot of folks think that you win an election. You know, if you think about an election being a ratio, the numerator of the people who vote for you over the denominator of everybody who votes, a lot of folks think that you just got to focus on the numerator. That's not it you've got to expand the denominator. And that's exactly what we're doing. Nancy Pelosi, the House Minority Leader, says Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's insurgent, very progressive victory that a lot of people, I'm sure, including yourself, have taken inspiration from. She says that was a one-off related to her particular constituency in New York. Senator Tammy Duckworth uh, says a left-wing radical agenda doesn't work here in the Midwest. What do you say to them? I'll just say, look, I don't think there's anything radical about saying that people should have access to health care. I don't think there's anything radical about saying that if we have an impending crisis around, uh, around the warming of our globe and climate change, that we should do something about it. There's nothing radical about protecting your Great Lakes. And so this notion that somehow we're talking about a radical agenda simply because uh, so many of those Democrats are beholden to the same corporations who on the back end of the policies that they push make a lot of money, I just think the characterization is wrong. Here's the other part of it. Bernie Sanders won in Michigan. And then Hillary Clinton lost in the general. What Michiganders have shown is that they do not have an appetite for the kind of centrist, democratic uh, uh, politician that both uh, Nancy Pelosi and Tammy Duckworth represent. And I think um, what they have shown is that they're excited about people who have a real message, an honest authenticity about why they believe what they believe, and are willing to go and reach out. Okay, so on that note about message and what you believe, Let's be clear, you've never held elected office before. You're 33 years old, you're a medical doctor. What makes you qualified to be governor? And what makes you want to be governor, yeah. want to be a politician? So I'll tell you, I'll answer the, first, the, the second question first. I, I was never supposed to run for office. If, if my dad, who immigrated here from Egypt, would have thought that his eldest son was gonna run for office, I think he'd have stayed back home. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that I, I got to travel back and forth to Egypt every summer. In those eight hours, I travel about 10 years difference in life expectancy. But if I were to start from my home just outside Detroit and travel 20 minutes south, I'd travel the same 10, 10 years in life expectancy. And for me, understanding how we could solve that is what led me to going into medicine. So I became a doctor because I wanted to do something about those inequities in health. 
And then I came to appreciate that the things that actually shape those inequities have everything to do with our politics. Whether or not you have access to a basic set of things, a good job that pays a living wage, puts a good roof over someone's head, clean air in their lungs, clean water in their cups, allows them to walk in their communities without being victimized by either a neighbor or the state itself. And so that's why I became a doctor. But I came home uh, after my role as a professor to rebuild Detroit's health department. And in that role, I had the opportunity to rebuild a health department that had been shut down when emergency managers through the state uh, came through. And, and they made the decision that they wanted to shut down a 185-year-old health department. I rebuilt that department from five employees and 85 contractors in the back of the building where people pay parking tickets uh, into a 220-person organization. We multiplied city funding for health 10 times. We were able to set us on a path uh, to breaking down the barriers that kids had to being able to learn and earn in Detroit, like we would want for any child anywhere. Made sure kids had glasses, stood up to big corporate polluters, made sure that our kids weren't being exposed to lead. And in that role, I have I'm the only person in this race that has real executive experience. I mean, we're talking about a $56 billion, 50,000 person bureaucracy. And other folks who might have been a lot, around a lot longer haven't actually had the experience in their legislative roles of being the leader of a piece of the machinery of government. And I'm the only person who has. If you are sworn in as the next governor of Michigan come January 2019, what will be your top priority as governor? What will be your first priority? On your first day in office, yeah. what are you gonna do? So there are a couple of them. Uh, number one, I want to shut down line five. Our Great Lakes account for 20% of the world's fresh water, 85% of the water in North America. And right now, we've got an oil pipeline that's 15 years past when it was supposed to shut down that's already had several incidents. We've got to shut down that Line 5 because we've got to protect that water. There are also issues related to water in Flint and Detroit. And in Flint, I want to set up a Flint task force that would work on within uh, the first year getting all of the lead piping out of the ground so that folks can, can drink easily in the, in the city of Flint. They have suffered too much and they still don't have clean water. And then we need to put a moratorium on water shutoffs in the city of Detroit. The city alone this summer shut down about 17,000 homes from having basic access to water because they can't pay. Meanwhile, we've got Nestle bottling our fresh water for $400 a year, and folks have to pay $400 a month in Detroit. I want to put a moratorium on that as well. How is it, and I find this astonishing, I've lived in this country for three years now, how is it that in the richest country in the history of the world, people in Flint, Michigan still don't have clean water? How is that possible? Priorities, right? Our state, for a long time, has focused its entire economic agenda on subsidizing these huge corporations. Meanwhile, they offshore and automate out their jobs. The story of Flint, Michael Moore told the story really well, and Roger and me, the story of Flint is what happens when you bet your entire economy on one corporation and that corporation leaves. And then it leaves the people there who have been marginalized into the worst jobs in the worst neighborhoods without access to the means of economic success. And they're left saddled with a bureaucracy that's way bigger than what they can sustain. And then when they can't decommission bureaucracy, which is one of the hardest things to do in government, right? we call them profligate and take away their right to self-determination. That's what happened in Flint. And right now, those folks still don't have access to water that they can trust that is clean and pure because our state government has decided that we've got a several billion dollar rainy day fund, doesn't want to invest that money into making sure those folks made money. How long would it take for you as governor to ensure that they do have clean and safe drinking water? If we're willing to put our, our, our foot on the pedal and make sure that it gets done, I believe we can get it done in the first year. The first year. You're a supporter of Medicare for All, of a so-called single-payer healthcare system, of a so-called single-payer healthcare system, and you've proposed introducing that at a state level. You, you call it MishCare. It's one of your big uh, signature policy proposals. Explain what that is. Yeah. Here's my challenge to you. Explain what that is. You're a health policy expert without using any of the mind-numbingly dull, technical, yeah. bureaucratic, jargony phrases that for some reason are inextricably linked to the healthcare debate in yeah. this country, which I find bizarre as an outsider. Yeah, well, I'll tell you this. What is it? What so, does it do? So you're, you're from the UK. Yep. In the UK, it's called single provider, meaning that the NHS provides all the healthcare. They employ all the doctors, they uh, built all the, and run all the hospitals. That's different than Canada's system. In Canada's system, you have what's called single payer, meaning that instead of having multiple insurance companies who you can get insurance from, who then pay for healthcare, what you have is the state operating as your insurance company. That's what we want. And if we can do that, what we can do is take the 10% of the costs off the top of healthcare that go into CEO salaries, like we see at Blue Cross Blue Shield, their CEO makes $13 million a year. And instead, what we have is a situation where everybody gets access to healthcare. There are no co-pays, there are no deductibles, there are no premiums. And because you can focus on providing preventive 
care and primary care, what you're doing is reducing the cost in health over the long term because it's been so dominated by the incentives that a lot of people have to make money off the system, whether it's the insurers or it's the hospitals and the doctors. And so what we're trying to do is take that system out and refocus on empowering the state to be the single provider of health insurance for people. Now the doctors stay private, the hospitals stay private, but the insurer, that's public. Has it ever been done before at a state level? Is there anywhere else we can look at to see whether it works? So not in the United States. They've, they've proposed uh, Vermont and both Vermont and California have proposed this, uh, but they haven't been able to get it done. But I will tell you this, the way that Canada was able to ultimately achieve single payer healthcare was when Saskatchewan, a province, was able to achieve it at their province level. Okay. So there is, uh, there is ample precedent for this. Um, but not in our state. Now, a lot of folks will say, well, Vermont and California are far more liberal than Michigan. If they couldn't get it done, how could Michigan? I'll just say this. Michiganders, given what happened in 2008 in the economy, we have the lived experience of either losing our health care because we lost a job or knowing somebody who did. And because of that visceral understanding of what this might do for somebody's life, I do believe that Michiganders uh, are a lot more in support of this kind of policy. Your opponent, Gretchen Whitmer, former Democratic leader in the state Senate, says about your health care plan, quote, I'm not going to utter buzz phrases. I think it's deceptive to tell people that you can do something that relies on two Trump waivers, an amendment to the state constitution and $100 billion. Yeah. Well, she's not going to do it because she's holding closed door fundraisers with Blue Cross Blue Shield who don't want to see this happen. Their CEO makes $13 million every year and is very happy with the status quo. Thank you. And so, you know, the fact of the matter is, um, is that it's not about what's possible. If you want to compare uh, understanding and background in healthcare, I'm happy to go toe to toe with any politician in the country. Um, it's not about what's possible. It's about uh, where her funders have said she can go. And I've got nothing against uh, Senator Whitmer. I think she's a fine person. I just think that she's playing politics in the same way that we've seen for far too long uh, by the Democratic establishment. And they go halfway because that's where their corporate backers and overlords are going to let them go. What needs to happen for the Democratic Party, which has been beaten at the presidential level, beaten at the congressional level, well, up until the midterms anyways, beaten at state house level, governor's mansion level, what do the Democrats need to do to become a national force again? What do they need to do to win back those voters in 2016 who either voted for third parties, stayed at home, or shock horror voted for Trump? Yeah, look, the big challenge that the Democratic Party has had is that we have forgotten what our message is because we've been so focused on cutting deals with these big corporations whom we think we need for backing. What Senator Sanders and others have shown is that if you just ignore the, the corporate funding and you're honest to your core about what it is that you want to do, an honest, deep message, you can both fund a great campaign and inspire people who have stayed home for so long. People who stay home, it's not like they're making an irrational decision about their democracy. They're just saying, I've got nothing I got to vote for. Because it seems like the Democrats and the Republicans, who are both getting funded by the same corporations, are kind of saying different sides of the same coin. It is on us to stand up around deep, abiding issues. Access to health care. Access to an economy that works for people. Access to a living wage when you actually work 40 hours a week. Access to an environment that's not going to poison your kids in the air and water. And we can't go halfway. We need bold solutions that stand up to the core of what our party was always supposed to be, which is the party for working people. And where does quote unquote identity politics fit into all of that? Because you're running in a state, Michigan, which was won by Barack Obama in the past, yep. but won by Donald Trump famously in 2016. You have people on the left saying that liberals are focused much more on race and not enough on class. You have people criticizing the left for making Trump's victory all about economic insecurity and the left behind and missing the whole racial resentment and white supremacy that obviously played a role as well. So where do you stand on this whole race versus class debate? And who should the Democrats be appealing to? Who are you appealing to yeah. when you're running for governor? Look, let's talk about the plight of, of the poor and working people in our state. And let's be clear, we know that members of communities of color are far more likely to be overrepresented among, among the poor and also among the poor working. So we've got a responsibility to talk about both, but let's, let's talk about something for a second. More people in Michigan voted for George W. Bush in 2004 than voted for Donald Trump in 2016. It's not like somehow there's this huge Trump wave, mm. but Donald Trump was talking about issues that unfortunately Hillary Clinton was missing. I'll tell you about my own uncle, voted for Donald Trump. His name is Uncle Rick, one of my favorite people in the world. 
I mean, this was a guy who would take you snowmobiling in the winters, he would take you water skiing in the summers, learned how to prepare venison halal so that my family could eat it. And he's not somebody who hates Muslims. So why did he vote for Trump? Voted for Trump because he lost his trucking business in 2008. And since then, after having to lay off people he knew and loved, since then he hasn't really seen the economy come back in his community. We've watched as corporate profits go way up. If you're on Wall Street, the economy's back, sure. But if you're in Gratiot County, Michigan, it's not back. And the reality of the matter is that he doesn't have to focus on issues of race. And so those, you know, that fringe of people who do vote for Donald Trump because of his positions, aberrant positions on, on racial and inclusivity issues, right? He didn't have to pay attention to that. Yeah. And so he was between a Hillary Clinton who wouldn't come to his community, right? Who wasn't talking about issues or saying the economy's back and a Donald Trump who was coming to communities like his saying, economy is not back and you have a right to be mad. And so for him- but Also blaming people who look like his nephew for the problems of the economy. That's true. But for somebody like my uncle Rick, right? He can always say, well, he's just, he's just saying that. He doesn't really believe it because it's not existential for him. Look, I'm not gonna ever excuse uh, anybody's, anybody's position on race ever. But you would accept that, you know, you're a person of color as am I. You would accept that people of color are worried that in this chase by the Democrats, by liberal media, you look at some of the articles that the New York Times and Washington Post are running these days, that people of color might be thrown under the bus in this obsession with Trump country, rural white communities, etc. That is a legitimate fear. That's a legit legitimate fear, but I think we're I think we're overextending the argument. I'll tell you, I've been all over the state of Michigan, 125 different cities. I talk to people all the time who voted for Donald Trump. They didn't vote for him because they agree with what he said about race. And let's be clear, for those folks who said those things, they're never gonna vote Democrat anyway. We've got to stop chasing them. Yeah. But what we do have to do is in our conversation about poverty and about the challenge of folks who are working in Michigan every day, we've got to center what the consequences of racism might mean for those people, yeah. while at the same time talking at the core about poverty and about challenges facing working yeah, people. I mean, They're not mutually there's no doubt about that. That was a huge problem. Donald Trump saying, make America great again. And Hillary Clinton's response was, America's already great. Well, it's not for a lot of people, as exactly. you say, living in poverty. You talk about traveling around the state. You said on Twitter recently that, quote, I used to think I could never run for office because my full name was Abdul Rahman Muhammad El Sayed. But in 2008, I watched a man named Barack Hussein Obama be elected president. They don't define what's possible, you said. The thing is, I mean, I love that line, but Barack Obama, of course, wasn't actually Muslim. I know Donald Trump thought he was or claimed he was and 50% of Republicans thought he was even till the moment he left office. He was still but think you, he is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You actually are Muslim, unashamedly Muslim. You are Arab American. Is Michigan, a state that is 80% white that voted for Donald Trump in 2016, ready for a proudly Muslim Arab American candidate for governor called Abdul? I've been all over the state of Michigan. And when people bet against my ability to win, they're not betting against me. They're betting against the good people in this state. And I've spoken to so many people, and I'll tell you, they don't care how I pray, they care what I pray for. I pray for the same things that Michiganders all over the state pray for or hope for if they don't pray. And that's my daughter, my, my wife, my family, my state, my community, my country, University of Michigan football, peace, justice. And I, I'll tell you that in, in those circumstances, right, if you can sit down with somebody, you can listen to what's hurting, you can talk to them about what we can do about it, and then you can propose a plan and execute, that's the work. And you know, I learned that as a doctor, right? Medicine is exactly the same. You sit with somebody in pain, you ask them what's wrong, you listen, you learn, you diagnose, and then you talk about a treatment and you do it together. That work hasn't changed. It's the same thing that we so need in our politics. So you genuinely don't think your race or religion will hurt you at all come the general election? The Republicans won't engage in an Islamophobic campaign against you? There won't be lots of accusations that you're a Muslim Brotherhood sleeper or whatever their latest we're gonna Islamophobic hear, charges? We're going to hear all of that. Of course we will. But do I think it's going to change the outcome? I don't. I think that there is a small, very loud group of people who is going to be particularly upset that, that a Muslim would dare uh, take advantage of his constitutional rights. <laughs> but I don't think that they are the majority of people. I think that most people see that and say, wow, that's ugly and it's the worst part of us. Let's move beyond it. Just out of interest, what kind of reactions have you had from, how should I put it, older white folks in some of the more rural parts of Michigan when you've been out campaigning? You know, a lot of folks will come out of interest, right? They'll have heard, wow, you know, he's got a lot to say and, and you should go see. And they come in skeptical and they walk out having taken a yard sign, signed up to volunteer and giving me big hugs and high fives. Um, 
you know, I've, I've, my, my family is, my father's an immigrant from Egypt, um, as is my mother. I was raised by my father and my stepmom, Jackie, born and raised in the middle of the state of Michigan. A whole part of my family are those same people who get stereotyped as, as Trump supporters, white working class folks. So I've been talking to folks um, from, from that demographic in Michigan my whole life, and I'll tell you, they're just good people. Um, and I think right now the, the political moment is confusing. I think we've got demagogues like Donald Trump trying to take advantage of people like them. Um, but my sense is that when you sit down with somebody, you look them in the eye, you do the human work of listening and learning and talking about what's wrong and what hurts, that people will, will look past the demographic. Given that you have this demagogue in the White House, this card-carrying Islamophobe, if you do win and become the first ever Muslim governor of a U.S. state, um, what kind of story do you think that will tell to the world? There's a global audience watching this, yeah. taking interest in your campaign. What kind of story do you think that will tell to the world about what kind of country the United States is, which has Donald Trump in the White House, but Abdul Sayed as a governor? It's kind of confusing. Redemption, I think that's really important. But then even beyond that, look, the people don't appreciate that the United States is not a monolith. And unfortunately, if you're looking at the United States from abroad, Appreciate it's just saying, well, look, this is America. This is what represents America. I mean, we had Barack Hussein Obama, one of the most dignified people you'll ever meet. You agree or disagree with his politics, he's a very dignified man. I agree. And he was replaced by Donald J. Trump, which is quite the opposite. Yeah. And, um, and I think what, what we are doing, unfortunately, is having a soul for, uh, uh, an argument over the soul of America on a global stage. And my hope is that what we can show is that the majority of good Michiganders, who by 10,000 votes, unfortunately, as a state, elected Donald J. Trump president, the majority of good Michiganders recognized the mistake and corrected him. You had a baby recently, I think eight months ago. Congratulations, your first child. How worried are you for her future growing up as a grandkid of immigrants from Egypt and India uh, here in the US. I'm a father of two girls yeah. living in the United States. I'm an immigrant in the United States. I'm pretty worried about bringing up my daughters in Trump's America. How worried are you? I'm worried. Uh, you know, Sarah told me that she was pregnant with Emily, our daughter, two weeks after <laughs> I, I launched the campaign. I sat down with her, I said, listen, if you want me to go and get a real job, I'll do that, I'll drop the campaign. She said, listen, our kid is going to be ethnically half Egyptian, ethnically half Indian, and 100% American. The best thing you can do for that kid's future is go win this campaign. And, um, and to me, it's a big reason why so many people are told they don't belong implicitly or explicitly by this president. But we know that America is about being a place where we engage in the idea of a pluribus unum, that out of many there can be one. And we have to insist upon that for our kids and any kid uh, growing up in this country who looks a little bit different, be they female, be they gay, be they brown or black, um, for whatever reason, being told that they're less than. How, as a governor, do you think you can resist a lot of what Trump is doing at a national level, federal level, whether it's the Muslim ban, family separations at the border, ICE raids? What are you going to do as a governor to push back against Trump? Well, I think, look, it's about showing a way forward about how we can build an inclusive economy that actually engages people, pays them a fair wage beyond the tax cuts that he's, uh, he's pushing that ultimately will leave uh, working Americans and, and poor Americans in some dire straits. Um, I think being able to create a counterbalance to that for people in this state is going to be critical. Number two, look, I've already um, taken a position that as governor, we as a state will not participate uh, with ICE, be that through our Michigan State Police or our Department of Corrections, because we don't want to be a part of tearing apart Michigan families uh, and tearing apart Michigan's economy. I think there's a lot we can do around protecting our environment in ways uh, that the EPA is trying to roll back. In particular, we, uh, we are home to the country's biggest reservoir of, of uh, fresh water, and um, we have a responsibility to stand up and protect it. And so I think there's a lot that we can do on the national stage. But I'll tell you this, any pathway for whoever wants to be president next in 2020 goes through Michigan. And by being able to show how progressive policy can change the lives of real people and to prove those concepts that we're all talking about, I think they have a lot of implications for who's president next, and I look forward to laying the groundwork for that. One of the things Trump did so well, sadly, is that he gave people someone to blame for their pain and anger. He said, look at those immigrants, those Mexicans, those Muslims, those foreigners. Is it fair to say that the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, led by people like Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, uh, now people like yourself, you also want to give someone to blame, but you're pointing the finger at corporations. You're pointing the finger at corporate greed. Is that fair? Definitely. I mean, look, look let's, just, let's just step back for 10 years. We have watched, as in particular in my state, we are the second biggest subsidizer of corporations in the entire country, both per capita and in absolute dollars. 
We've watched as those corporations have offshored and automated our jobs, and we leave people in positions where either they don't have jobs and they've stopped looking, or the jobs that they have don't pay them a fair wage. And they're having their unions busted because of what those corporations are doing to our politics. And those corporations are lobbying to the tune of billions to return trillions into their bottom lines. We've got a responsibility to stand up against them. And that's not to say that everybody who works for a corporation or anything like, no, I understand how the world works. But you've got these entities who have multinational scope, who are leveraging their power to control our politics, to deliver money for this amorphous group of quote unquote stockholders. And meanwhile, you've got the corporate executives, many of whom are making huge amounts of money off of those stock trades. We've got to stand up, and I'm not against corporations per se, but I am against the corporations who are using their influence to break the, 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 the barrier between our economics and our politics. Turning America into an oligarchy. Exactly. And, and, and that's kind of what we've seen. I mean, if you look at the biggest challenges we face, healthcare, why? Big corporations at the insurance level and the conglomeration at the provider level. If you look at the, 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 the environment, so much of this is about uh, oil corporations trying to maintain a system where we're burning fossil fuels into our kids' lungs and hurting our atmosphere. If you look at why our economies uh, don't work for people, well, because they're busting unions and making sure that people make less and less while they're turning jobs into robots. At every juncture, yeah. it's because of the ways that corporations so, have behaved without empathy. So Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, who won in New York, huge upset. She caused a lot of controversy when she proudly declared herself to be a democratic socialist. Uh, you had Nancy Pelosi basically coming out and saying, no, no, we're still capitalists in the Democratic Party. How do you describe yourself? Would you call yourself a socialist? I'm a progressive. And what that means to me is I believe in an America that ought to be more just, more equitable, and more sustainable. I think words obviously have meanings, but sometimes those words have different meanings to different people. And um, I think the socialism word is, is one of those words that has very different meanings to very different people. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, coming out of science, I know that a word only has value when it has shared meaning, when I can say the word and it communicates the same thing to you and to anybody else. And so I, I just think these labels are a little bit overblown and, yeah. you know, people sensationalize them. I'm a progressive. If you don't win on Tuesday and the polls show, you know, it depends on which poll you look at, but you're not leading in the polls, it's going to be an upset if you come from behind and win. What happens to all this energy and excitement that you've generated here in Michigan, uh, especially with younger people? Does that all disappear or do you harness that to another cause? We're going to have to harness it to a different cause. Look, I'm running for office because I believe in the responsibilities of the values that I serve, of the responsibility to work for equity and justice and sustainability in the world. Um, you know, I, I think the, 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 the focus and the passion that we've seen, it's all there. And that work continues, whether I'm in office or I'm not in office, the work has to continue. I hope that I can continue to lead on those values, whether it be as governor uh, or another role, and to continue to push our politics and our government uh, to be able to actuate those values in the work that it does. Just before we finish, you're someone who's not from a political background. You're from a scientific medical background entering politics. So who are your political heroes, living or dead? Who have you drawn inspiration from? Teddy Roosevelt, somebody I, I definitely look up to, his cousin uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Um, I think Malcolm X, uh, Martin Luther King. Um, uh, I, I, I value different aspects of what um, Barack Obama was able to do leading from uh, the, the position he was and showing so many people themselves and politicians for the first time. Um, and uh, and, and I, I look up deeply to what, what Bernie was able to do by having a raw, honest politics. Um, I'm, I'm always motivated by um, anybody who's led uh, from a position uh, of honest contemplation of what people needed, um, led on their values, and worked their hardest to change the circumstances around them by harnessing harnessing the power of people and showing people the way forward so that they could go and create the future they wanted for themselves. And one last question. There might be an Arab American kid or even an African American kid watching this interview at home right now and they're thinking, well, I could never be a politician. Mm. I could never run for office because of my name or my skin color. Whether you win or lose on Tuesday, based on what you've seen and learned over the last year, what would you tell that kid? What would your message to them be? I would say this, look, I believe the same thing about myself. Um, I thought my name was going to preclude me ever from getting into the public arena, but we need you. Um, your voice matters. And this, this process is grueling, but to me, the moments where it's the most satisfying is watching somebody who's never seen themselves in a politician before do a double take at one of my political signs and be like, it looks like a normal political sign, but it says the word Abdul on it. That's not supposed to happen. 
except for that it is. This is what this country is about. Um, we need your voice. We need you out there. We need you engaged. We need you proud of who you are. Don't ever apologize for who you are because this country is about accepting who you are and engaging you in the broader we the people. Um, and so, you know, I hope that you will. And it is scary as hell. I know how scary it is. Um, but when good people stand down, that's when we allow people with different values and different b beliefs that are not consistent with what the core of this country is or what, you know, just the common courtesy of humanity ought to be, um, to take that power and do what they're doing with it. And so we need you now more than ever. Proclaim yourself, stand up, be proudly who you are, um, and proudly American, because those two things are not mutually exclusive. They are what make this country so incredible. Abdul Al-Sayed, thank you so much for taking time out to speak with us. Uh, my privilege. Thank you so thank much. Thank you.